you slip out just a little bit early, I'm not walking out. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <coughs> back right from yes. like a week ago or so it's been i think two or three weeks, two or three weeks. are you um are you what do you have after this um just uh paul's taking me out to dinner you're welcome okay. to join us if you want to i was gonna um, say paul, go grab a drink or something well i'd love to um right. he made reservations i think it well, we'd love for you to join i mean dr archmond's coming and a couple other folks um and then maybe he made the reservation okay. earlier let me know. Yeah. let me know yeah and how long are you there Till tomorrow evening, and then I come back in May for the trustees meeting. Okay. So. okay. Let's talk after. Yeah. We're gonna. Sure. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kaylee Henstock. I graduated from Greensboro College in 2016, and I'm currently the director of alumni engagement. I would like to welcome everyone to the Kanban Schoenberger Colloquium Series. This is also the kickoff for the 2019 Alumni Reunion Weekend, so please, if you are a graduate from Greensboro College, please stand. There's a couple of us in the room. Welcome back to campus. Thank you for coming. I would also like to introduce Professor Edith Shepard, Professor of Spanish Emerita. Please stand. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Now I would like to introduce Victor Archibald, and he will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's not quite often that you have an occasion to ask the teacher to take pride in introducing your former friend, former student, former village member. I said former in the sense that I have somebody here that each time I look at him, I said, you know, I may not make a whole lot of money, but this is the job. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I don't have a script, but I want to share a couple of things with all of you about the speaker this afternoon. I taught political science single-handedly for the years. And there were some students that would challenge me and tell me with my intellect. And there were some students that really didn't care. The speaker this afternoon is one of those that challenged me. Challenged me to the extent that he said, you know what? I want to know who you are. I said, what do you mean? He said, I want to see your parents. I want to see your village. I want to see your relative. I thought he was kidding. I said, do you have a passport? He said, no. I said, well, we're not serious. <laughs> In less than three weeks, he produced a passport. Then I knew I had to do it. So I was able to get him a Nigerian visa. My daughter, who was at Duke, said, Dad, I'm joining you. And we took off to Nigeria. I said, Josh, I asked you just to call your parents just once, once we get into Nigeria. Call them when we're leaving Nigeria, and he did. And we enjoyed Nigeria. 
and the learned Pharisees, and I'll learn from him. I still remember questions that Josh raised. Doc, why is everybody calling you uncle? Are you all related to these people? And I had to explain. It was a learning moment for myself and for himself. Over the years, we stayed in touch, so he's a great friend, not just a former student. But I got so excited when he joined the Board of Trustees of this college. And I said, this is what it's all about in a small college. That a small college could recognize what students are doing, what former students are doing, and be able to recognize them. But I speak of Josh in the sense that I remember many years ago, when he was the body student president of this college, he invited his people. And for the first time in my 32 years here, the college brought metal detector for him to go listen to the speaker. He had to go through a metal detector. That's how controversial the speaker was. But he did. So this afternoon, what is he going to be speaking on? Social justice. So when I reflect on all that, I say, Josh, thank you for coming. But let me introduce him in terms of his title and what he has done. Um, he is a Reverend Dr. Josh Nobley. He is an associate of a pastor and minister of social justice and evangelist, St. Mark United Methodist Church. He lives in Atlanta. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist. This afternoon, he's going to share with, with us his thoughts on healthy sexuality and healthy faith in a rapidly changing world. It is indeed, again, my pleasure to welcome, and I hope to join in welcoming Josh Knott. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure and a treasure to be back uh, at Greensboro College. Um, man, these were some formative years for me here. Um, I really love my time and just walking around campus, all of a sudden all these little memories started popping up and I know my fellow alumni uh, feel the same way. Of, I remember when that conversation happened right there. I remember when that whatever happened right there and you know, just, just being, um, being back in this energy is always a wonderful thing. Um, I wanna just kinda locate myself um, in this conversation. Um, uh, the topic, of course, is the informed citizen, uh, which has, I think, been the theme of the lecture series. And the topic that I wanted to, to share some remarks about today is healthy faith and healthy sexuality in a rapidly changing world. And to kind of locate myself in this conversation, I just want to share a little bit about my background. Um, I was born and raised in Western North Carolina, uh, in the United Methodist tradition specifically. Um, and I recognize there probably is a diversity of tra traditions uh, in the room. And so I invite you as I'm sharing about my experience from the Methodist tradition that you take what you like and leave the rest. And hopefully this will provoke some thoughts about your own tradition um, and how these things might resonate with you. Um, so uh, born and raised in the United Methodist tradition, um, uh, about three or four weeks after I was baptized, I was taken right on down to the church, or after I was born, I was taken right on down to the church to be baptized. Soon got involved with uh, children's ministries, summer camp, confirmation process, um, went on to come to Greensboro College, uh, which is a Methodist affiliated school, was educated here, worked at summer camp over at Camp Tacoa in Hendersonville, um, and then went on to do a faith-based AmeriCorps program in Oakland, California uh, called Mission Year, which was a really formative experience for me working in the inner city uh, of Oakland. Uh, with a lot of youth out there. And then came back to the South to go to seminary at Emory University, Candler School of Theology, also a Methodist affiliated school. Um, and then was ordained as a deacon in the United Methodist Church. And then served, uh, have been serving at St. Mark United Methodist Church in Atlanta, which is a predominantly gay, lesbian, transgender congregation. Probably about 75% of our members uh, are of the LGBTQ community. Uh, and then I went back to Candler School of Theology and got another, uh, my Doctor of Ministry degree, just finished that last year. So I am steeped in the Methodist tradition, for better or for worse, all that comes along with that. Um, but it has been a very formative experience for me and it has shaped who I am. Um, and, and I'm proud of it, despite some of the misgivings that we saw in February, which I'll talk about that in just a few moments. Over the course of my career, um, I had the opportunity to um, become a licensed marriage and family therapist in Atlanta. I have a private practice now. I see about anywhere from 15 to 20 clients a week. 
And one of the things that um, early on when I started sitting with clients, one of the things that kind of kept coming through was that they all wanted to talk about sex. <laughs> they all had some kind of sexual problem that was coming up and they wanted to talk about it and they wanted to talk about it with me. Um, and I didn't know why that was or why me or whatever, but as long as I can remember, I've certainly had a love and fascination for both faith and religion and also a curiosity and fascination with human sexuality. And so, you know, I felt like, wow, I probably need to spend some time getting some credentials so that I can be a competent source of information for my clients. And so I went about uh, with the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists, which is one of the really um, uh, re well-respected institutions in, in the United States, uh, to get a certification to become a certified sex therapist. And that is what I've been uh, ever since. And it has been, I kind of stumbled into that, but it really stumbled into my calling uh, because it is something that gives me a lot of life. And I love sitting with my clients and talking about these very, very deeply personal um, things. And it's really interesting when I, tell, when I tell people what I do, often the response is, what? <laughs> like, you know, pastor, sex therapist, and then throw in on top of all that that I'm a gay man. And it's just like sometimes that it just sort of like makes people's head explode a little bit. But it's who I am. It's what I bring to the table. And I'm proud of it. And it's been, um, I've been shaped by a lot of folks over the years that have helped me find my voice and find my sense of authenticity. Uh, and that's what I try to bring to my clients, regardless of whatever their tradition is. I don't consider myself to be a Christian counselor. I'm a therapist, and the therapist's job is to be non-judgmental, convene safe space, um, and to help folks kind of connect some dots and get to where they want to be in their life, out from underneath some anxiety and some depression, out from underneath a lot of shame. Um, and we know that um, both faith traditions and religion, as well as human sexuality, bring a lot of shame and a lot of um, discomfort in our culture, certainly in the, cult, in the climate that we're in right now. So I want to talk about all those kind of things. And contrary to popular belief, <clears throat> or a lot of people believe that human sexuality and faith are completely separate things, as if they can be compartmentalized in some kind of way. And that is just not true. I don't believe that at all. The truth of the matter is, is that we are all born both spiritual beings and sexual beings. Um, and it is my belief that part of our task in life and part of our invitation in life is to integrate into wholeness these two things, these two different parts of our being, to integrate those th two things together. Um, Dr. Bill Staten, I'm going to refer to him a fair amount in my talk today. He's uh, perf uh, pretty, had a pretty profound influence on me as a therapist and a sex therapist specifically. Uh, he was an American Baptist pastor. He's, he's still alive today, but he's retired now. But he uh, worked with the Surgeon General over the years. He's been a certified sex therapist himself. He's done a lot of research and made a lot of really powerful contributions to the field of faith and sexuality. And I, I'm going to reference him a fair amount. But one of the things that I thought was really helpful uh, that he, um, he shared with me was that religion has taught that the acts of sex has been the big problem, like sort of focusing on specific acts in specific context, and that that is the focus and the problem from the perspective of Christian tradition specifically. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, because if that is the perspective, at worst, it makes us hate our sexuality and the sexuality of others. And at best, it makes us suspicious of our own sexuality and certainly the sexuality of others. And I don't think that that's a real healthy place to be. And I don't think that that's the only way of looking at things. In fact, I know that there is another way within the Christian tradition specifically that opens up all kinds of different possibilities. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, and just to, sort of as an example, you don't need me to share examples, but I will, uh, about how hate of sexuality or suspicion of sexuality ultimately can and does lead to violence. When I was a student here at Greensboro College, um, Matthew Shepard was killed in 1998. And that was, you know, those folks, uh, all of the violence that I know about at least, um, ultimately has its roots, violence around sexuality has its roots in religious tradition. Um, and that is a big problem. It's a public health problem. It's a moral problem. It's a, it's a crisis across the globe. There are people still today that are getting killed. Not, and I'm not even talking about gay folks. I'm talking about women in some countries who have premarital sex or have an extramarital affair or are accused of such 
get stoned to death in 2019. Horrible, 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 horrible. And I think that we can do better in our theology to come up with a different um, conclusion that doesn't lead to violence. And so that's what I want to share about today. In the Christian tradition, Jesus is the central figure and focus of God's love and work in the world. Never does Jesus once refer to any sexual act or practice. You don't see it. It doesn't happen. Never once does Jesus condemn sexual pleasure. Show it to me in the Bible where it says that. It doesn't. Uh, what Jesus is concerned about is the wholeness of people. Uh, Jesus is concerned about spiritual well-being and concerned about loving relationships. That is, that is what Jesus is very much concerned about. And one of the things that, and, uh, that um, uh, just a little brief sort of biblical um, education here, you got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Of those Gospels, three of them are what we refer to as the synoptic Gospels. John was kind of written by another community sort of elsewhere geographically. And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot of overlap in, in what they write. And one of the things that we see in all three of the synoptic Gospels is this emphasis on the greatest commandment. That you have the leaders of the time, whether it's a lawyer or a Sadducee or a priest or somebody, comes to Jesus and they want to know, what is the most important thing in life? What is it that I'm supposed to do? What, how can I get into heaven? What is the greatest commandment? Something along those lines. And Jesus responds the same way each time across all three of those Gospels. And that is... Um, the greatest commandment, and I want to sort of put that up here real quick, which I believe is the lens by which we are asked to interpret everything else about this tradition. And that is, and I'll just read it to you here, it says, <clears throat> and this is the one that comes from Matthew, it also is found in Luke and, and, and Mark as well. It says, when the Pharisees heard that uh, Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. And the lawyer said, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said back to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this last little sentence right here is the most important. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's what it says. That's what it says. And so what that says to me is that we are required to whatever whatever midrash or whatever discussion that we have or whatever deliberations we have around all of th everything else in our tradition and in the scriptures if somehow the conclusion that we come to does not point to this love of god love of self and love of neighbor then we have gotten it wrong and we have to go back to the drawing board and come up with something different that falls in line with this and so that's kind of the lens that i want us to think about uh, as in our conversation today one of the things, um, let's see, make sure I've got. So uh, one of the things that um, I think um, religion has been oftentimes a, a, a barrier to um, conversations about healthy sexuality, but it also, I think, has some tools that can be really helpful to us. Um, actually, let me back up before I, before I say that. Um, the, the latter part of the talk is um, rapidly changing world. And I had this elaborate timeline that I was going to put up on the screen here. And then due to technical difficulties, I kind of messed things up a little bit. But I have a paper version, and I'd like to sort of share <laughs> old fashioned uh, just a few highlights just over the last 50 years. I'm going to start like in the 60s and just kind of hit some highlights to talk about you know, this, this rapidly changing world that we live in. Uh, science tells us that modern humans have been around for as many as 200,000 years. That's a lot of years and a lot of people that have passed through this planet. And if we think about all the change that has happened over those 200,000 years in technology and thought and how societies are organized, that kind of thing, but fast forward to the times that we are living in right now. We are living at the peak of human civilization in technology, modern medicine, transportation, you know, how we organize ourselves, how we communicate. All of a sudden we've got Google Translator that allows us to bridge that gap. And I'm sorry, I don't have my Spanish skills the way they're supposed to be from being in Senor Shepherd's class, but that Google Translator sure helps out a lot. Um, but that, that these, that we are living in the peak of civilization right now. 
It's amazing. And so we think about just since the 60s, I want to hit just a few highlights to demonstrate what a rapidly changing world that we live in. So in the 1960s, we had the backdrop of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, um, the Vietnam War, and the beginning of the Masters and Johnson's research, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which was, which was very, very formative around human sexuality and understanding of that. 1960, the first birth control pill was approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, 1967, Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case, which uh, allowed for uh, interracial marriage. That was a major, major um, step forward. Um, then in 1968, the United Methodist Church was formed when the Methodist Episcopal Church and the United Brethren Evangelical Church merged together and formed what we now know as the United Methodist Church. Who knows how long that'll last? <laughs> but we'll see. We're hoping that, that we can somehow manage to stay together. But along with that came full clergy rights in the United Methodist Church for women. Um, 1969, California was the first state to approve no contest divorce. It used to be that you had to have a reason to get divorced, and if you just didn't like your spouse, you were stuck in that marriage for the rest of your life, and you, you had to produce a reason and proof that you had to tell a judge who then could decide whether you could get out of your marriage or not. But California was the first state to approve no contest divorce, and then other states followed along after that. 1969, Denmark became the first country to legalize pornography. How about that? And then the United States came along soon after that. And 1969, one of my favorites, the what? Stonewall Revolution in New York City. And that happened at the Stonewall Inn, which is still there today. Uh, it was a gay bar, a lot of drag queens, transgender folks, mainly people of color that were there in that, um, that establishment. And the police raided it one too many times. And those queens that night had had enough. And they took their high heels off and they started fighting back. And it turned into this big riot in the streets. Uh, and it led to what we now are still experiencing as the modern movement for LGBTQ rights uh, in our country and all across the world. Really, really amazing. Um, so that happened in the 60s, and, and I'm, I know I'm missing some glaringly obvious things as well, and I would invite you all to maybe share some of those as well. But shifting over to the 70s, we still have the Vietnam War going on, the sex revolution is in full swing, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. You have the women's liberation movement. Then in 1972, in the United Methodist Church in response to all this change that's happening, that's where we get that really harmful language uh, exclusionary towards LGBTQ folks that is inserted into the Book of Discipline, which says that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching and that gay folks are not allowed to be ordained, nor are they allowed to get married in Methodist facilities or by Methodist clergy. And we have been fighting about that ever since in 1972. But again, you know, things happen in response to each other. So you have these major steps forward, and then you have this backlash, mainly from the, from the religious community that oftentimes sort of pushes back on some of the progress that is made. 1973, Roe v. Wade was decided by the Supreme Court, and we've been fighting about that ever since as well. Um, 1979, kind of in response to a lot of the stuff happening with LGBTQ folks, women's liberation movement, and especially to Roe versus Wade, the moral majority was founded by the Reverend Jerry Falwell, 1979. And their main issues were anti-gay, anti-abortion, prayer in public school. That was their platform. And there were some other issues along with that, but that was what they wanted to see happen. They merged all that into the heart of the Republican Party where it has remained ever since. And again, we've been kind of um, fighting about a lot of this stuff ever since in the culture wars. Shifting over to the 1980s, the dawn of the horrible HIV and AIDS epidemic around 1979 to 1981. Millions of people have died uh, as a result of that, but thank God for uh, medication. And I'll talk about some of those in just a second. 1980, Marjorie Matthews was elected the first female bishop in the United Methodist Church. 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, first woman. 1986, a Supreme Court uh, case out of Georgia, Bowers versus Hardwick, which actually upheld the sodomy laws in Georgia. Um, sodomy laws is not just about anal sex, it's also about oral sex, and it doesn't just apply to gay folks, it applies to straight folks as well. And those laws were challenged because the cops staked out some these, these two guys that were having consensual sex in the privacy of their own space, and the cops raided their house and busted them while they were in some kind of sexual act, and they took that all the way to the Supreme Court, which in turn said, yep, it's okay for Georgia to have those laws on the books, and so they were upheld, 1986, Bowers versus Hardwick. 
1987, AZT was approved by the Food and Drug Administration, which was a life-changing savior for many, many folks with HIV and AIDS. Brought a lot of folks back from the brink of death, and some of those guys are still around today in my congregation who likely would have died, and all of the people that they knew at that time died. Uh, but for whatever reason, they were spared because they just the timing of it was just right and they were able to get access to that life-giving medication. 1989, public commercial use of the Internet began, and that ushered in a whole new life for, for, for all of us. Uh, shifting over to the 90s, and I'm going, I'm going fast through this, but I've got a lot of other things I want to touch on. Clinton was elected president in 1992, um, and 1994, the don't ask, don't tell policy was implemented with the United States military, which we look back on that now and think, really? But at the time, that actually was a step forward, come, come, you know, if thinking about it, that um, before you could be dishonorably discharged and lose all your benefits for being accused of being gay or being gay in the military. Uh, President Clinton uh, signed that into law, uh, and that changed the culture to where you didn't have to tell that information and they weren't allowed to ask. So that was a step, at least in the right direction, which was later, later overturned uh, by President Obama. <coughs> 1990, let's see, 1996, Viagra was approved by the Food and Drug Administration, and that changed a lot of things for a lot of folks. Uh, 1996, also the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal sort of forced that conversation upon the American people and to have, you know, make reference to things that they might not have been comfortable talking about before then. Um, and then 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act was passed, which for federal purposes recognized marriages between one man and one woman and allowed states not to have to recognize same-sex unions or marriages from other states. So again, some back and forth backlash uh, right there in the 90s around that. Skipping ahead a little bit, um, <laughs> 1998, the first of many celebrity sex tapes were leaked. The Pamela Anderson, Tommy Lee sex tape was kind of the first one of that genre, and we've seen a number of those ever since that have kind of, again, forced some of these conversations into, into um, the public. Shifting over into the 2000s, um, the Supreme Court decision of Lawrence versus Texas was decided, which overturned that case that I mentioned earlier, Bowers versus Hardwick, which struck down across the nation once and for all uh, the sodomy laws uh, banning um, various types of sexual behavior um, between consenting adults and the privacy of their own home. 2008, Barack Hussein Obama elected president. 2010, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell by President Obama. Then in 2015, Ober Oberfell versus Hodges, which legalized um, marriage for all people uh, across um, the United States. And that was a pretty big deal with my congregation uh, because, again, we were 75% LGBTQ folks who have been a part of that congregation since the early 90s. Many of them who paid their, their offerings and their tithes to our church were not allowed to get married in their own church. But a heterosexual couple could come in off the street, rent the facility because they wanted to have their reception down the street at the Fox Theater, and get married there while the folks that are there day in and day out were not, did not have access to the same rights in their own church. So that was a huge celebration in my congregation. 2016, Karen Olivito was the first lesbian elected bishop in the United Methodist Church. We've been fighting about that ever since as well. 2016 also, 2016 was a big year, y'all. Um, Trump's Access Hollywood, you know, the pussy grabbing comments, you know, were forced again into the American public and we had to deal with this and think about it and talk about it. And it was just, I resent still having to talk about that with people <laughs> because I'd much rather be talking about other things besides that, but because it was this big deal that this person that might become and ended up did becoming the president of the United States had said these horrible things about women. 2016, Trump was elected president. Then in 2017, Alyssa Milano uses the hashtag MeToo in response to Harvey Weinstein and sexual assault and sexual harassment that happened uh, under his watch and, and by him. And then that ushered in a whole lot of other things as well in conversation about, you know, what is touch? How, what is appropriate touch? What, how do we talk about and how do we believe folks who have made these accusations? How do we treat those folks? Then in 2019 or 2018 also Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings where again we're sort of forcing these conversations into the American public psyche and having to talk about these things about consent and about sexual assault and sexual harassment. Very important conversations, painful though nonetheless. And then here in 2019, we just got finished in February with the United Methodist General Special called General Conference on the Issue of Human Sexuality, so they said, but it wasn't really about human sexuality. It was about homosexuality, and it was about power. 
and it was about who gets to be in charge and who gets to call the shots. And unfortunately, um, as many of you won't, I won't get into too much of the insider baseball around that, but this thing called the traditional plan was passed, which usually over the course of history, just like MLK says, the arc of history bends towards justice and it bends towards expanding rights for folks. In this case, we took a step backwards. Instead of opening up the possibility for gay folks like myself to be legally ordained, um, we took a step back and made it more punitive. Um, and so uh, now all of a sudden there's more punitive measures um, and punishment that goes along with either trying to be ordained as a gay person and certainly if you're doing a wedding either in a Methodist facility or by a Methodist clergy person. That'll all be litigated out in the Judicial um, Council of the Methodist Church uh, actually later this month as a matter of fact. Um, and we'll see what happens. My prayer is that we can all stay at the table because these are not issues of salvation. These are not issues of, you know, doctrine of any kind. These are sort of perspectives about social issues. And it's fine, I think, to disagree as long as we're not infringing the rights of somebody else. So I, I make no apology about where I stand and where I'm located in that. And I, I want to be real transparent about that. And you don't have to agree with me either. That's okay and that we can still be in this conversation together. And that's part of what healthy faith and healthy sexuality is about, is to be able to stay in the conversation with somebody who may not agree. And it doesn't mean that we have to call each other names or tear each other down or do any of those kind of things. Because at the end of the day, we're all humans. We all want love. We all wanna give love, we all wanna receive love. And I think that's at the heart of both healthy sexuality and healthy faith. That was on my little timeline there, and I wish I could have put it up there on the screen for you to see. But all that to say that um, what are some helpful and healthy ways of engaging with these two deeply personal topics of faith and sexuality? Religion, as I said earlier, has often been a barrier to healthy sexuality, but it, I think that it can also help us come up with some healthy solutions. And so one of, the, one of my favorite things in the Methodist tradition is this thing called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and to kind of talk about this a little bit more, um, there's Mr. Wesley, um, kind of a stern looking gentleman. If I, you know, looks like he doesn't put up with anything. <laughs> but there was a, um, a Methodist scholar named Albert Atler who did a lot of Methodist research, read a lot of Wesley's sermons and scholarship and writings and that kind of thing. And he's the one that first kind of coined the phrase the Wesley quadrilateral. And based on his reading and writing and scholarship about John Wesley, he realized that Wesley really accessed four specific things when discerning either a theological or a social or even a political issue. And those four things were scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And that all four need to be a part of the conversation in order to come to some kind of rational conclusion or at least come to a, a well-informed conclusion about a particular issue. And so I want to kind of use that as a little bit of a framework to kind of guide our conversation for today, or at least share with you some of my thoughts working through the Wesleyan Quadrilateral around the issue of human sexuality. Um, I love this way of, of, of thinking through theological issues because it encourages questions. A lot of times in religious traditions, they don't encourage questions. You're not supposed to ask those kind of questions. This encourages questions. It invites us to study and to gather new information and to kind of put that, com put that information in conversation with ourselves and with others. It invites us to explore and probably more importantly, it invites us to be in conversation and dialogue with others who may not agree. And again, that's okay because we're all sort of part of this tradition and we're all moving through life together and we all have something to share with each other. Information is power, ignorance and shame wither in the presence of knowledge and empathy and compassion. And this is something I think that is really important and a very important part of healthy sexuality and, and healthy faith. I wanna kind of share a, a funny little story. For many of us, in, 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 when I'm in my clinical setting with my clients, um, one of the questions that I'll ask them, particularly if we're dealing with a presenting a sexual problem of some kind, is I'll ask them, when did you first remember discovering the existence of sex? And one of the things that's interesting that I hear more times than not is that with, you know, if they dig back far enough, usually there is some kind of awkward or embarrassing or confusing or even traumatic memory that is associated with when they first discovered sex or sexuality. Um, 
it leaves a lot of unanswered questions, particularly depending on how old you are, just the, having capacity to even sort of understand what we're talking about here. And there's not usually somebody safe to ask those questions of. There's this implied sort of shame, or there's this implied like, shh, shh, we don't talk about that. And so it leaves the young imagination to kind of figure it out on their own. Um, I think there are some changes happening around that, but that was certainly my experience. And my parents are awesome, but <laughs> I want to share a funny little story. Uh, one, of my, one of my mom's friends, uh, when I was probably maybe in second or third grade, uh, was going to have a baby. And all of a sudden, with my little inquiring mind, I wanted to know, why, why is she having a baby? Like, where, how did, how, why is her belly getting big? So there's a baby inside her belly. Well, how did the baby get there? So my mom <laughs> um, just gave me the little birds and bees talk. And I don't remember the specifics of that con conversation. But what I do remember is that somehow she told me that the man gets on top of the woman, penis gets inserted into vagina, there's a seed planted inside the woman, and that grows into a baby. Decent explanation. But in my mind, <laughs> I'm picturing like a piggyback ride kind of situation. <laughs> and I, I didn't quite, you know, I didn't want to ask too many questions because I felt uncomfortable asking that. But somehow I thought that, and y'all are going to probably boo me off the stage for saying this, but I thought that the testicle was the seed. And depending on how many testicles you had, that was how many kids you were going to have. <laughs> and I only have one younger brother. I also have two testicles, so I was like, huh, I'm, my, we, we, this must be a thing in our family. And so like, <laughs> I believed that for a couple of years after that until I got some new information. But that's just a funny, you know, harmless example of how when we don't really have a whole lot of access to information, our minds can kind of make up a narrative. I mean, humans need a narrative to understand the world around us. And so that was my little narrative for a couple of years until I... Um, Fortunately, my journey into knowledge around sexuality didn't stop there. <laughs> so shifting back to our Wesley Quadrilateral, I want to talk a little bit specifically about Scripture. And I've already kind of given a bit of a framework around the greatest commandment as sort of being the lens by which we can understand that. But I want to also say this. The Bible is not a sex book. Did y'all hear me? The Bible is not a sex book, contrary to popular belief. The writers of the Bible, who spanned several thousand years from the time, now there was a lot of oral tradition that went on for thousands of years before somebody finally put pen to paper and captured the original sort of five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All that was passed down through oral tradition for thousands of years before somebody actually wrote it down. And then there have been many, many, many writers that make up what we understand the canon of the Old and New Testament to be now. But those writers were not as concerned about specific acts of sex as they were about human relationships <clears throat> and the motivations and consequences of sex. You see the difference between the, the acts of sex as opposed to the motivation behind and the consequences of sexual sexuality. And it's interesting because Christians specifically have a whole lot of flexibility in their interpretation around issues about money, tithing, how we spend our money, where that money goes. On divorce, a whole lot of leeway there. Menstruation, thank God. Women speaking in church, pigs, slavery, and on and on and on. And thank God we have leeway around that. Thank God that we have evolved in our thinking around some of these issues. But when it comes to pleasure, sexual pleasure specifically, when it comes to sex and pleasure, all of a sudden we have this sort of absolutism that comes into play, this rigidity that sort of is in play. And I have to kind of ask the question, why is that? Well, I think if we were to kind of look back over the tradition of the church and Christian history specifically, and again, I'm sort of speaking from my own tradition here, I think that that can uh, illuminate a little bit about why that is. There's, a, there's sort of a dualism that was set up way back at the very beginning of the Christian tradition um, of this idea of the sacred and this idea of the profane. And along with the sacred comes the spirit, and along with the profane is the body. And so you've got this sort of dualistic thinking around body and spirit. Body bad, spirit good. And we see that because the, the writers of the New Testament specifically were influenced by popular philosophy that was going on at the time in the Greco-Roman world. And just three examples of that are sort of Platonic thought, dualistic cosmology of Plato, which um, said that the soul and the mind are at war with the body, right? 
Then we've got the Stoic philosophy, also in the Greco-Roman world. And their, one of their main um, points was that nothing should be done purely for the sake of pleasure. That if you do something purely for the sake of pleasure, that that's somehow frivolous or somehow inherently sinful or wrong. And then you've got the Gnostic traditions over in Persia, and their whole thing was about freeing the spirit from the bondage of the body by denying pleasure. And so you see how this philosophy sort of shaped some of the early writers of the New Testament, as well as some of the thinkers like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and some of these other folks that, that wrote very sex-negative language and baked it into the very beginning of the Christian tradition. And so that led to things like the supremacy of virginity and cel celibacy, right? That that somehow is revered and that's better than being sexually active. Um, sex for procreation and not for pleasure. The idea that sex is carnal or of the body and therefore intrinsically sinful. And all of those kind of perspectives led to this legalization of sexual shame, right? So shame is kind of, again, built into the very foundation of our tradition. And I just don't think it had to be that way. I think that that was a mistake. The writers of the New Testament were human beings. They were not God. <laughs> and I think that that based on they probably did the best they could at the time, but we are still evolving as a human race. And there's been a lot of things that have happened since then that I think we can access to give us some additional information. And we can't really talk about sexuality without talking also briefly about marriage. You know, the notion that marriage as we know it today has been around for thousands of years, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, women were often considered property or some kind of transactional pawn, you know, to unite two families together for either political or economic or, or what other practical reasons. Folks got married again for political alliances, to protect a bloodline, to raise capital, to expand the workforce by having a bunch of babies that could then work in the fields for inheritance rights or property rights, other practical purposes. Love had nothing to do with it. It was all about either having kids or solidifying economic or financial power. So what's love got to do with it? <laughs> um, sex outside of these things uh, at that time and for the majority of the time that humans have existed, if you had sex sort of outside those parameters of those alliances or raising money or expanding the workforce, that was considered a threat. And that's where a lot of the laws around pleasure and sexuality came from was because there was a lot of money or, or resources or, you know, um, political power at stake. So love as a reason to marry didn't really even emerge until the late 1700s, right around the time that the United States was founded as a country. Um, you had this emphasis on happiness. We see it in our own Declaration of Independence where you have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is what Thomas Jefferson sort of wrote into the Declaration of Independence. And so that, out of that kind of emerged this idea that is marrying for love and for desire was a part of sort of the known and acceptable world. And then when we shifted over in our, the development of a wage labor economy kind of moved coupling away from economics, thankfully. And in the timeline that I kind of emphasized in the 60s and 70s, you saw the empowerment of women specifically. And so economic and political and financial reasons for marriage were not really as valid as they used to be. And so it opened up all kinds of new possibilities about how we could you know, do relationship. And you didn't need the approval of family or faith or society. And that, I think, I'll go ahead and posit that that's a good thing, that there's freedom in being able to marry and have desire for who you wanna marry and have desire as opposed to being forced into some kind of situation for the good of the family, or because some priest said so, or because there was some kind of financial or economic stake at play. So major changes uh, over the course of those 200,000 plus years, but especially within our very lifetimes. Um, years and years of church history um, just have looked very different uh, along the way. I wanna kind of shift over um, into talking about uh, reason. Um, there's a lot of things that, that we could say uh, about reason, and I think what, what Mr. Wesley was referring to with reason is taking into account logic, scientific advancements, common sense, those kind of things that need to be part of a conversation when we're discerning a theological or social issue. And I think definitely that is true when we're talking about human sexuality. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are both sexual and spiritual beings. And there's been tremendous uh, advances in our understanding about human sexuality, certainly since the 50s and 60s. We, we had um, 
Alfred Kinsey, the Masters and Johnson folks. We had a number of other folks that I'm going to reference here in just a second in helping us to understand that indeed males and females were bor are born sexual and that sexual responses occur from before birth until death. We have evidence uh, through the Masters and Johnson studies that in utero, females vaginally lubricate. And if anybody's had a little baby boy and you had an ultrasound, we know that males have visible erections in utero. They do. And in sleep as adults, every 40 to 80 minutes, that vaginal lubrication or male erection happens every 40 to 80 minutes while we're asleep as adults, unless there's some kind of disease or chemical sort of something going on in the bloodstream. Like that happens all the way through the rest of life cycle. In addition to that, <clears throat> in the female anatomy, there's this little organ, y'all may have heard of it, called the clitoris. It has no other purpose other than sexual pleasure. No other purpose. And so, given all of those things, clearly we are created as sexual beings and intended for sexual pleasure. It's part of who, what our bodies are created for. And so the Masters and Johnson studies, they, they did um, a lot of really interesting uh, work um, around they, in, their, in, the, in their university setting in St. Louis, they literally would have folks come into their university um, laboratory. They'd hook up all kinds of devices to monitor their blood pressure and their breathing and their heart rates and all this kind of thing. And they would have sex in the laboratory and they'd be kind of watching them and monitoring what they were doing. And they did this with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of couples having sex. And they developed and learned a lot of information about that. And so we've got the, the, this is a physiological description of the human, uh, the sexual human response cycle. You've got the excitement phase. So this is for men and then this is for women. You've got the excitement phase. You've got the plateau phase. You've got the orgasm phase. And then you've got the refractory period, okay? Or that resolution period right there. And what we see in the excitement phase is that, you know, muscle tension increases, there's a heart rate in increase, breathing is accelerated, you see blood flow into the genitalia, into the nipples, um, there's vaginal lubrication, all those kind of physiological responses kind of start. Then with the plateau phase, all of those things intensify a bit, and then the heavy breathing, the heart rate goes up, blood pressure increases, and then muscle spasms begin both in the feet, the face, and in the hands. And then in phase three, all of those things, again, continue to intensify. And then you have involuntary muscle contractions, blood pressure, heart rate, breathing are at their highest rate. And then there's a sudden forceful release of tension and the rhythmic contractions happen in the vagina and at the base of the penis resulting in ejaculation. Then in the final phase of resolution, there is this slow return back to a normal state of being with the blood pressure and the breathing and all those kind of things. The swelling subsides, that there's a general sense of well-being, enhanced intimacy and fatigue. Interestingly, uh, we see over here with men, in the sexual response cycle, there is one orgasm. Y'all ladies, multiple <laughs> orgasms in the same sexual experience. I'm so jealous. Like, the, like, you know, but that, but that was something that was not really known until some of this research was done. I think that's a pretty important piece of information as far as our understanding of the physiological response around human sexuality. I want to add a couple of other thinkers. So we've got sort of the, uh, the red here is the Masters and Johnson thing that I was just talking about. Well, we've got two other thinkers um, that I want to sort of make reference to. Um, Helen Singer Kaplan, who did a lot of exploration around this idea of desire. And that none of this really gets off the ground at all, absent coercion, without desire being in place. And so that desire really is the first thing. That needs to happen first. And when desire is, is in, well, when there is a lack of desire, what she found in her research is that that is almost always due to some kind of childhood trauma, something related to our belief system, something about our body image, or something about, you know, how we feel about ourselves, self-esteem, and, and maybe some other things as well. But those are kind of the central things that get in the way of desire, and they present themselves all the time in my clinical setting with my clients when I'm doing sex therapy. David Reed was another person that added a, uh, another important, this blue line right here, and I'm gonna talk about this. And actually this David Reed, sort of the, cap, the desire piece, and then David Reed sort of, um, he calls this the erotic stimulus pathway, which is more of a psychological 
uh, view of the human sexual response cycle. And he divides it into four sections. You've got the seduction phase, which is kind of like if you drew a line right here, you'd have the sensation phase kind of right here. Then you have the surrender phase, which is that window right there, and then the reflection phase. And I think this is actually, this is the tool that I use when I'm sitting with my clients trying to sort of discern what the origin is of a particular sexual problem. The seduction phase is everything that happens before touch begins. It's the activation of the mind. The mind is the most powerful sexual organ that we have. And the more that the mind is engaged, we see this at the beginning of relationships. There's this thing called the limerence phase where things are kind of hot and heavy at the beginning or there's butterflies in the stomach or there's sort of this anticipation of wanting to be with my beloved and wanting to spend that time together. And, and oftentimes there's sort of this thinking about pleasure and maybe I want to wear that cute underwear just in case something goes down or maybe I want to make sure that there's, you know, paraphernalia in the right places just in case or I want to make sure I'm smelling fresh or looking my best or got that fresh clean haircut or whatever it is in anticipation of hopefully pleasure. And so again, the mind is actively engaged. Um, and so that's all part of the seduction phase is sort of hyping it up, thinking about it, keeping it on the mind. Then the sensation phase is when touch begins. So everything that's kind of on the menu in the sexual experience, um, and I'll leave your minds to sort of concoct what that might be for you. Um, but that is the sensation phase. Um, and then there's, after the sensation phase, you sort of see this in the plateau section of the Masters and Johnson, there's a window that opens up called the surrender phase. And if orgasm and ejaculation are going to happen, that's where it happens. And in order for that to happen, there has to be this surrender or sort of letting oneself go so that that can happen. And it's almost a little bit of an altered state of consciousness for some, you know, where you just sort of let go and that experience happens. And then after that happens, there's a, what they call a reflection phase. And this is arguably the most important phase where you look back on everything that just happened and assign meaning to it, okay? And if I look back on this experience that I've just had and my, the meaning that I assign to it is generally positive, like that was hot or that was exciting or I feel so close to my beloved or, or that was amazing or that I've never experienced something like that before, then that can serve as an aphrodisiac. Let's see if we can make this happen again. Whereas if I look back on this and there's either a painful experience or something uncomfortable that is assigned to that, then that can really zap that erotic spark. And so I use this as a tool in trying to kind of identify for folks where the problem originates, where in this cycle does the problem originate. A lot of times I see for folks who have been together for several years that the seduction phase is the, is the thing that's kind of gone by the wayside. Um, kind of get into a little routine about things or maybe the same time, same place, same bat channel. <laughs> and, and there's not as much thought put into it. And so that's a problem. And, and then there's other problems that are associated with these others as well. So I wanted to kind of give you all just a, a little crash course around some of, the, some of the things. And I would be remiss if I didn't also, let's see. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge Alfred Kinsey and his um, sexual orientation scale of zero to six, and then also a separate category uh, for X, which is for asexuality. Um, you've got sort of um, zero being exclusively heterosexual, six being exclusively homosexual, and then you've got a wide variety in between. Um, what he would argue, and what many uh, of those of us in the sex world, sex ther sexology world, is that there are very few, if any, z absolute zeros and absolute sixes. Um, but, you know, it just kind of depends. But this is just an example of Alfred Kinsey's um, sexual orientation scale that was developed in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and he was really the, the first person that had really done any kind of research. Nobody else was, uh, everybody else was afraid to kind of touch this with a 10-foot pole. But he went in and, and, and did a lot of research and interviews and that kind of thing with folks uh, from a variety of sexual orientations. All right. <clears throat> So shifting over to experience in the, in the quadrilateral, there's a few things that I wanted to kind of hit on um, that, that, are, that come up quite a bit um, in my practice as far as how <clears throat> ideas around healthy faith and healthy sexuality play themselves out in their everyday lives. And some of the problems, some of the things that get in the way of that. The first thing, borrowing again from uh, Will Staten, Bill Staten that I referenced earlier, is these cultural barriers that are in place uh, especially in the United States, uh, around sexual pleasure. And he says that our culture is sexually traumatized. 
And I want to say a few words about that. If you think about the images that we get every day from advertisement, from the type of TV shows that we watch, um, they want to have us believe that the kind of people that have sex are the people that have perfect bodies, they are young, they have money, and they're not religious. And they have this sort of level of freedom and lifestyle that most of the rest of us don't have access to sometime. And if we don't fit into that sort of narrow scope, that somehow we either aren't sexual or we are unworthy of being sexual. Like that's a lot of the imagery that we get sort of in our pop culture. And advertisements, I mean, the, people capitalize on our self-doubt. You know, the things that we are concerned about ourselves or the ways that we feel unworthy. Many people make money off of that because they try to sell us project, um, products that capitalize on our self-doubt. And so we are sexually traumatized culture. The second thing he says is that we value in our culture sexual ignorance. We still are having conversations about abstinence-only education. Or any sex education curriculum, certainly in public schools, doesn't touch pleasure with the 10-foot pole. They don't talk about it. They don't acknowledge it as if it somehow doesn't exist. And don't like, get me started about church sexuality curriculum. Oh my God. I mean, the, this abstinence only thing, it, the idea that if we tell them about it, somehow they'll rush out and go do it. When the research indicates that people go do it out of ignorance, they don't know and they don't have that information and therefore go and make mistakes that cost them around their health, unintended pregnancies, those kind of things. Parents oftentimes are not sure what to say, uh, such as my mother. Um, <laughs> but she, we, we had a, another conversation a little bit later about that. Um, and she's probably going to be watching this a little bit later, so I want to just <laughs> love you, Mom. <laughs> um, but oftentimes what I hear from parents is that, you know, here's a book, read it. If you have any questions, let me know. Do you have any questions? Nope, I do not at all. Okay, great, good talk. And that, that's not really helpful. You know, that there's this implied, again, shame, because we don't talk about this. I can't tell you why we don't talk about it, but we don't talk about it. And so that implies that something bad is afoot. Um, and it also doesn't give any information about how to be a good lover, you know, or how to, how to, I don't know, express communication about desire and around fantasy and around how we want to do these things with our beloved. The third thing is that our culture is sexually secretive. Sex is this great mystery and that is not appropriate ever to share with anybody what our deepest fantasies and sexual thoughts are, th thoughts are with anybody. That's what's valued or that's what's emphasized in our culture. And those who do share ideas like me, probably today some of you might be thinking this about me, is that they're perverts that they are somehow, you know, other, and we don't really, that, that's something that they're, they're over there and we're over here and that we don't, you know. But that's something that is, is, I think, a real cultural travesty that we live in. The fourth thing is that church and faith traditions have not valued sexual pleasure in their curriculum and education. There's this implied procreation stance that intercourse happens with the opposite sex in the context of marriage in a way that promotes pregnancy. Now, some folks may not articulate that, but that is the implied message that I certainly got from my little Methodist church down in Charlotte I grew up in. But that rules out all kinds of things like birth control or masturbation or homosexuality or premarital sex or kink or anything else that might be on the sexual menu that doesn't follow that one very narrow path. And I think that these things are really problematic and cause a lot of problems for folks around how they feel about themselves and what they do. <laughs> Game of Thrones is coming up. <laughs> it's my favorite show. I've watched the whole thing through all the way twice already. And um, I had a funny little thing I wanted to share with you all. Let's see, where is it? Shame! Shame! <laughs> if y'all haven't seen the show, <laughs> if you haven't seen the show, that won't mean anything. But this lady right here is somebody that is to be afraid of. And she's a nun-ish, or she plays this nun character. And she marches one of the main characters through the main streets of the city after she has committed some kind of sexual deviancy, ringing this bell saying, shame, and everybody's, you know, throwing rotten fruit. Anyway, this, so, but I wanted to talk about shame. <laughs> um, 
because I think that this is one of the main presenting issues that I experience in my, in my clinical setting. Um, and Brene Brown has some really powerful things to say about shame. She's, a, um, she's written a number of books. This is one of my favorites. It's called Daring Greatly. Um, she's a researcher at one of the University of Texas schools, and her sole academic and clinical inquiry is into shame. And she defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. This is one of the top presenting issues in my, in my sexual practice, in my um, clinical setting. Shame is experienced by all people. It's a universal feeling unless you're a sociopath and un incapable of feeling anything. Um, but otherwise, it is a universal experience. We're all afraid to talk about it, and the less we talk about shame, the more control it has over our lives. And that's what Brene Brown says. Um, she shares that there are um, 12 shame categories um, that came up consistently in the research that she, she offered, and that was around body, and appearance, body image and appearance, um, being a mother or father, or being in response to our own mothers and fathers, um, addiction, aging, surviving trauma, money and work, family, mental and physical health, sex, religion, and being stereotyped or labeled. Those were the themes that came up consistently over and over and over and over in the shame research that she did. But the remedy to that, and one of the things that we deal with all the time in a clinical setting, is shame resilience. There's no such thing as shame resistance, but there is shame resilience. Because as long as we care about connection, the fear of disconnection will be a powerful force in our lives. That's what Brene Brown says. And that practicing authenticity when shame is experienced is a way of moving forward. And I, I want to just read just a brief thing that she says, which I think is really powerful around shame. <clears throat> she says, if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. Self-compassion is also critically important, because, but because shame is a social concept, it happens between people, it also heals best between people. A social wound needs a social bomb, and empathy is that bomb. Self-compassion is the key because when we're able to be gentle with ourselves in the midst of shame, we're more likely to reach out, connect, and experience empathy. And I think that's really important, and an important piece of understanding healthy faith and healthy sexuality is that shame needs to be addressed right head on. I also want to talk just briefly about um, anxiety and depression. Um, very, very powerful in, when it comes to all kinds of psychotherapy issues, but definitely in issues related to sex and sexuality. And I think about anxiety as kind of being stuck in the future, sort of fearing things that might come to pass. Whereas depression is kind of being stuck in the past, beating self up over things that did happen or should have happened or didn't happen that, you know, just that, that my, the brain is either stuck in the future, fearing what might happen or stuck in the past, beating self up about things that didn't happen. And, but the one thing that is always in the present moment is our physical bodies. And part of um, discerning healthy sex and sexuality is really getting touch with our, our five bodily senses. And that's one of the things that I do in session with a lot of my clients is uh, have them do some meditation as a way of really accessing each of the five body senses in, you know, in the present moment. And if we can just put on pause just for a few moments, that rhetoric or that tape that's playing about the future or that tape or rhetoric that's playing about the past, that we are able to disconnect in a way that helps us to re-engage those things with, a more, with things being a bit more in perspective. One of the things about anxiety that I think is really interesting is that the brain, sort of our base, sort of more primitive part of our brain, doesn't distinguish the difference between anxiety and physical danger, right? I know for me, and I, you, you, you all can share with me what you think about this, but when we think about anxiety, you know, when you think about getting anxious about something or nervous about something, what are the physiological responses that happen? For me, hands get sweaty or I start to, my blood pressure goes up a little bit. I start to kind of, you know, like get tense, um, you know, sweaty palms, pit in the stomach, muscle tension, intrusive thoughts, all those kind of things. Well, what also happens when we're in physical danger? all of those same things. And so the body is responding because it thinks that we're in danger. It's trying to help us out. But those things really get in the way of healthy sexual functioning and certainly in the way of healthy faith as well. And then depression robs us of our desire. If we're stuck in the past, 
you know, beating ourselves up over, over how we look, over how we're perceived about something, then desire is oftentimes one of the first things to get sacrificed. The last thing I want to talk about in experience is communication. <clears throat> Again, one of the top presenting issues of sexual dysfunction in, in, my, in my practice in, in, in the sex therapy world is this lack of communication. What we know is that talking before, during, and after sex enhances pleasure. And we want to encourage pleasure, right? We want folks to have fulfilling and healthy sex, sex lives and sexuality. And bringing sex into the common vernacular in intimate relationships is a very healthy thing. It allows folks to kind of share some of those, share some of that vulnerability, to share, you know, what our desires are so that we can get more of what we want and also be good lovers to our, good lovers to our lovers, to our beloved. And to make it accessible in conversation, remove the taboo, and be able to share and enjoy God's good gift with our beloved. So I have um, shared a lot of information with y'all today. <laughs> and I wanna just kinda close with just a few thoughts. Um, as I said at the beginning of my talk, um, we are born both as spiritual and sexual beings. And that part of our task and part of our invitation as we move through life is integrating into wholeness these two aspects of our being. It's a joyful journey to be on. If we allow ourselves to go there, if we allow ourselves to have some conversations about this, and I really appreciate you letting me kind of force a lot of this information on you all. Maybe you didn't quite know what you were getting yourself into when you came into this conversation, but I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you stayed. And I really do believe that shifting from an acts-based um, religious belief system to one of relationship, of relation, you know, valuing relationship and seeing it through that lens really opens up all kinds of new possibilities for the Methodist church, for anybody, you know, whatever tradition that you're a part of, that thinking about things in terms of relationship and how that honors and uplifts our higher good, both for self and for the other and uplifting and serving their higher good as well. Like how do we, you know, how does it help to see things through that lens? And to encourage folks to ask questions and to not be afraid to explore and to be in conversation with others and especially to find the joy, to find the joy and leaning into the curiosity and the questions rather than resisting them or pretending like they're not there. That is a major part of healthy sexuality as well. Let's see. Oh, one other point I wanted to make and then we'll maybe pause and, and have some discussion if you're up for it. Sexual pleasure does not hinder either spiritual growth, nor does it hinder service to humanity. And oftentimes we think of folks, you know, that have participated in various sexual acts of some kind or somehow not worthy of being, you know, in spiritual growth or in service to humanity, and that's not the case. Um, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And that is indeed a wonderful thing. One of my favorite pieces of scripture, and I'll say this, and then I'll, I'll sort of shift into question answer mode, is. Um, in the birth narrative uh, in Luke, <clears throat> when um, the angels come to the shepherds who are out in the fields, um, the first thing that they say is to be not afraid. I'm bringing you some good news. And it's for all people. And to me, that is a really power, empowering uh, bit of scripture for me, uh, because some of the things that I guess our, a lot of church and faith traditions have implied is not good news. Shame is not good. Anxiety, depression is not good. But what is good is sexual pleasure and being connected to our beloved and to celebrate all of ourselves, not just part of ourselves. It's good news. And it calls us out of our fear and into abundant life. So I'll pause there. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and uh, Yes, Janine. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. It's great to have you back. Thank you. Um, and Josh, in your studies and travels, is there a faith tradition that tends to do this better mm. than another? Um, there are a lot of non-Christian traditions that do this a lot better than we do, for I mean, sure. Maybe better is not the right word. Yeah. But 
differently. Yeah, differently that leads to different results for sure. I know within the Christian tradition, um, I've seen a lot of really powerful and helpful things come out of the United Church of Christ tradition. They have a very sex positive curriculum called Our Whole Lives or OWL for short. Um, that that engages a lot of this um, conversation. In fact, Bill Staten, who I who I referenced earlier, helped kind of form that curriculum in the United Church of Christ. Um, I think that um, a lot of indigenous cultures uh, are across the globe do this way better than we do. Um, there's again this sort of duality between body and spirit is not really recognized in a lot of other traditions the same way that it has been in in Christian traditions. Um, so those are, I guess, some initial thoughts about that. Yeah. Yes. If reason for optimism, and it seems in the, the Christian tradition, we do better, not just that uh, you know, the, the faith doesn't have to get in the way of body, but, but it's you should treat your body better mentally and physically because it is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And faith can actually be helpful in that, not just it doesn't have to get in the way, but it can be faith-based, better mental health, faith-based, mm -hmm. uh, better physical health. You think we may get there with Whereas once you've divorced it from procreation, then anybody can be allowed that <laughs> gift and certainly not just right. men and not just kind of right. a bear to bear. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, um, kind of the blessing and the curse of the internet is sort of access to all this new information and, and, and sort of, I think a lot of sort of sexual minorities finding each other um, and that is really empowering. Um, I think in faith traditions, um, you know, part of the problem, certainly in the Methodist church, is that we got this ridiculous polity and parliamentary procedure that gets in the way of being able to have healthy dialogue like this. You can't have a dialogue like this through parliamentary procedure, you know. And I think our, you know, where you get two speeches in four and two speeches against and then we vote. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense for anything really but i mean i mean that may work in sort of government settings but that does not work at all uh in church settings and i think that's part of the problem is that we don't have ways to have these conversations i don't the information is out there it's just a it's just parlaying that information into folks that are making decisions about these things um, and also making it accessible to as many people as possible which is why i was delighted to be able to come here and sort of share some of these thoughts um, so that we can just again just a thousand conversations that kind of lead to to new understanding about this. Um, yeah, Keith. Hey, Josh, thank you for being here. Uh, for three years now, we as a Methodist school have had an LGBTQ group. We're over 50 in our, our listings, and uh, we're graduating 10 people this uh, semester, and the new generation is coming in. It is very exciting, and it has meant much dialogue, and so, for instance, there's a student who ended his, his coursework in December, is in New York working in theater, and he and I communicate regularly, not on theater, but on mm -hmm. mysticism, on meditation, and on these issues. He raised a book with me uh, that I was just slightly familiar with by, I think, Bessel van der Kook mm -hmm. on trauma. Mm -hmm. And I saw you had trauma up there, and that is something that is for all our lives. And I helped him to put together that with Victor Frankl's book about the suffering, and Frankl himself said the suffering in the Nazi camps is no different than the suffering that we all have for whatever mm. our personal concerns and issues are. And I, I just wonder, uh, as, as, the, uh, as that comes together, how would you help us to direct uh, the discussions because many students come here with some traumas mm -hmm. and um, and sometimes I find myself looking for extras mm. uh, or that I've done over the years to to stay up to date with them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on what we uh, might share with these great students? So um, one of the things that comes to mind is when I was a student here at Greensboro College um, uh, Janine Falcon was a really important person in my life um, and convened, she, she, and I've taken this from her, um, she convened safe space around herself all the time. 
and, and allowed, you know, whether it was the books on her shelf or whether little trinkets around her office or the things that she would drop into conversation around human sexuality or around race or around class or around diversity, things like that. I think that goes way further than any scholarship or any research or any book, is that just that convening of safe space because it really ultimately empowered me later on down the road to come out of the closet and to feel good about that and to feel empowered around that because I wasn't ready at that time, but because I knew that she had been in my life and a number of other folks that had allowed me to sort of just move through that process at my own pace. Um, and I think the same is true with trauma, is that folks will hold on to trauma for years and years and years before they feel like they can say something and oftentimes might feel empowered to say something because they either find somebody else that's shared the same trauma or they get a clear indication that somebody is safe to talk to. Um, and so I'm indebted to Janine for that and, and many others. Um, yeah. Yeah. Growing yeah. on this campus and I think that makes us a better community. Yeah. Yeah. Lena. about like as a parent coming from a tradition at church you know I remember my youth minister saying his first experience was on a bare skin rug and stuff like that and he wasn't married and he looked at us and I was like don't do it <laughs> okay I had questions all right because I was like what do you mean don't do it why do you, you know all that kind of stuff and then I remember the book there was a book if you have questions here are the two naked parents they're doing it whatever <laughs> and then that was it and so now you know AJ's 13 and I'm trying to change my setting of how to communicate with my children to not let it be like it's some kind of faux pas, like you can't talk about it, you can't experience it. And I try to my best to be very open with him if he asks questions. And before he even asks questions, I kind of just lay it out there. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mm -hmm. And so sometimes he feels a little traumatized. <laughs> <All right? laughs> I'd rather, rather my child know. Yeah. I mean, we talk about everything, but at least I want him to feel comfortable but in my mind still, I have like this war going on. Mm. It's like this war of like how we were raised in the church of what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to tell our children this is the only way it's supposed to be. But that's not necessarily the case that maybe how God's going to lead them mm. in their lives. And so how can I let them feel comfortable in who they are? Mm. Have you ever seen the movie Moonlight? Did you see that movie? No. Came out a number, couple years ago. Won the, won the best picture, actually. Um, and there's a scene in that movie, Mar Mar Mahersh, um, I never can get his name right, um, Ali, the, one of the main characters. Um, there's a, the, one, of the, the, one of the characters is a, is a child who's probably about eight or nine years old at the time, and he's having this conversation with Mahershala Ali uh, about how he's getting called faggot and stuff at school. Mm -hmm. And he asks, am I a faggot? And he says, no. Or what, what is a faggot? You know, a faggot is a term that is used to make gay people feel bad about themselves. And then he says, am I gay? Um, and the response, I think something along the lines of, you don't have to know right now. It was the, was the thing that I thought was really powerful in that conversation is that you don't have to know right now. You'll know when you know. Um, but here are maybe some examples of sort of how that what that looks like, what a healthy gay person or what a healthy sort of, you know, sexual being looks like, you know, to sort of put some examples out there um, that they can get, begin to wrap their minds around whether they identify with something or not. Um, I don't know if that... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And do you also believe that many people have it wrong? That's not the way. It is meant to be interpreted. Yeah, I have a lot to say about Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> um, there's so many problematic things about that story, just in general. Um, you know, and I, if I had my Bible with me, I'd sort of read it out loud. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that, that sort of just gloss, get glossed over about that story. Like, for example, the, 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 I guess the, the angels come to the, the guy's house, Lot's house or whoever's house it is and need refuge. And then all of a sudden there's these villagers that are pounding on the door saying, we want those guys to come out here so we can rape them and have sex with them. And he says, no, no, don't take the guests. Here, take my virgin daughters instead. What? 
Like, <laughs> that's crazy. Like, the fact that we would even reference that story as anything related to sexual health at all is absurd. Uh, because there's nothing but a bunch of rape that's happening in that story. And uh, I, just, I, I just, I almost start laughing when I hear people reference Sodom and Gomorrah because it's so obscene, the whole story. And if we flip over to the book of Ezekiel, they specifically reference Sodom and Gomorrah and say the reason that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed was because they didn't have hospitality for strangers. It says it right there. In fact, I'll oftentimes, if I'm giving a talk and somebody throws that up there, well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? It says it right there. It's like, well, I invite you to flip over in your Bible to Ezekiel chapter, whatever it is, and I want you to read it out loud for all of us. Go ahead. And it says it right there. And to me, if, if you're going to be fundamental about it, well, then be fundamental about it. And that's what it says in the text is that, that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were about lack of hospitality for strangers. Never mind the other problematic aspects of that story. Uh, we would never, at least I would be horrified and somebody would go to prison if they tried to instead hand them over their virgin daughter instead to be raped out in the front yard. <laughs> it's crazy. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I do feel kind of strongly about that particular text. Yes, sir. As you will know, Josh, you're a member of the Board of Trustees and works with the, you know, the faculty we have in the room, which we talk about all the time. Uh, if you look at our strategic plan, which you've looked at closely, and that's summarized right over there, as a matter of fact, in that one-page laminated plan, mm. being affiliated with the United Methodist Church has been critically important to us for 180 years. And our language that's actually in our plan talks about being open to everyone, including identifying sexual orientation. But now the church has done what the church has done, with the legal proceedings still you know, to play out. Um, but you are, I'm sure, well aware there's a lot of conversation among the colleges and universities that there may be real difficulty in staying in the affiliation with the Methodist Church long term if this mm -hmm. decision stands. Mm -hmm. And in fact, today there was an announcement that Baldwin Wallace, who is maybe one of the more conservative mm -hmm. Ohio schools, is seriously considering announcing, even before the judicial hearing is done, that they will leave the affiliation. Mm -hmm. um, having done here, having been ordained, now a member of our Board of Trustees, can you predict the future? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I wish I could. I'd, I'd be a lot richer than I am today if I could do that. Um, I can tell you what I think might happen um, for whatever that's worth. Um, and who knows if that's the case or not. I think, um, I think and I pray that the Judicial Council will rule the traditional plan that was passed unconstitutional, cast the whole thing out, and return us back to the status quo that we had before. And that will then trigger the exit of the conservative right from the denomination. And that will leave behind, you know, the progressive and centrist folks. So the interesting thing that happened as a result of this special called General Conference is that issues related to homosexuality used to be progressive issues only. That's where it resided. That's where it was sort of pushed. Uh, now those issues are centrist issues because the folks that have been kind of sitting on the fence or maybe just didn't have much of an opinion about this or just, you know, were a little uncomfortable with it but just preferred not to talk about it are now furious about the fact that we now are being forced into some kind of like process because these guys couldn't live with other folks at the table that disagreed with them. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, and I'm fine with that. You know, I'm fine. And, and, and the other thing is... <sighs> The Methodist Church has taken a number of different forms over the years anyway. When, in 1838, when this college was founded, the Methodist Church was very different than what we understand it to be today, the United Methodist Church. And so there's been a number of merges and splits that have happened for various reasons. It used to be that slavery and race was the issue, you know, and black folks got sick and tired of sitting in the balcony and being treated like second-class citizens, and they formed the AME Church and the CME Church and some, the AME Zion Church. Um, rightfully so, you know. Glad, I'm glad that happened and that folks sort of felt the empowerment to step out and say, we are not going to stand for this anymore. And <clears throat> if it means that the progressive folks end up leaving the denomination, I know Senora Shepherd was talking about in the Quaker tradition, there was a similar split that happened um, in the Presbyterian Church, the Episcopalian Church, the Lutheran Church. I mean, you know, it, it is one of these things that for whatever reason, and again, I think it's a lot of things we talked about, about, you know, shame being baked into the very foundation of the Christian tradition and left unchecked or left, you know, without sort of, in, you know, having some inquiry about that or some, some thinking about that leads to this perspective that it's all or nothing. Um, I don't think that that honors the liberal arts tradition. 
Um, I don't think that that honors the best of who we are as Americans, <laughs> you know, uh, being curious and being celebrating diversity and sort of that arc of justice, bend, you know, arc of the universe bending towards justice. Um, so my hope and what I think is going to happen and what I hope will happen is that the Judicial, judicial Council will rule that out and that the, the conservatives will leave. But who knows? Robert. So uh, today on NPR, there was a story on empathy and how empathy has declined by almost yeah. 40 or 50 percent over the last three years. How do you think, like, and I, I love Renee Brown's desire for empathy to be overcoming of shame. So if we can't empathize with each other, then that shame is going to just continue to yep. grow. And so how do you instill empathy in people or help people to have empathy? I mean, I think, you know, kind of what I was referring to earlier about convening safe space is that, you know, our actions and our consistent actions over time really speak volumes. And I know you do that in the work that you do as, you know, as chaplain here at Greensboro College is just convene that space. And when somebody that you don't agree with, I think, comes into the radar or into the conversation that we don't treat them with disrespect. You know, even if it's just in front of one other person, that seed is planted for how this conversation might look in a different way. You know, we've got... And I, I know that there's probably some political diversity in the room, but I'll say it. I mean, we've got a leader at the top that has no problem personally attacking and degrading people in a way that we have not seen before. It is different now than it was before. It just is. And we have to kind of turn that off a little bit. And I think sometimes limiting access to the news media, maybe to once or twice a day, twice a day instead of just... I'm guilty of it too. I check my CNN app all the time or I check and I am appalled at the latest thing that so-and-so has said or so-and-so has done. And, and it just sort of kind of stokes that fire within me. But what does it look like to maybe sort of back away from that a little bit and to try to, and I'm guilty of this too. I sometimes lose my patience in conversations, um, but I think that's part of the gospel. I think it's part of, you know, who we are as Christians is that we are called to love and love is hard. And it's costly in a lot of ways, and it should be, because otherwise it doesn't mean anything if we didn't have to sacrifice anything for it. Well, yeah, Spider. Hey, Spider. Hello. <laughs> um, so how, I'm going to the people who disagree with you and the people who have attacked you. I'm in conversation with people who are really crossing the line of white nationalism, and I got two Jewish daughters in the other room over there that I have to worry about. How can I? Or how do we develop empathy when, well, that point of view wants to actually physically hurt us? I, I don't think that those are new questions. You know, I mean, you can't tell Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that, you know, that we are not, that, that empathy is beyond us. You know, I mean, he faced violence beyond what we're experiencing now. Um, crosses being burned, he was shot to death himself, you know, num numerous threats, a lot of folks over the course of the American Civil Rights Movement who faced these odds and far worse. And I think that they, we can look to them and see how they handled this. They said, no, we are not going to engage in violence. We are not going to do it because that is not who we are, that is not our belief system, and that it is stronger to stand up, even if it means to the detriment of ourselves. And that's a tough decision to make, and that's a very deeply personal decision. But to say, I am not going, and just like in the Bible where Jesus talks about turning the other cheek, I've, I've read some, uh, Walter Wink is a, a scholar that's really engaged this idea of turning the other cheek that is not about being a doormat, but it is about asserting your humanity. And, and it's hard, and it does sometimes require sacrifice. Um, and I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to impose that on your beautiful daughters or anybody else. But I think that, you know, for me at least, um, when I've been at General Conference a couple of times, um, the, the Westboro Baptist Church folks often show up. And I've done a little bit of training around Soul Force, which was, um, I forget the guy's name that founded that, but um, was around nonviolent strategies for social change and how do we engage with, in a nonviolent way, a, a direct nonviolent uh, intervention um, by sometimes um, putting our bodies in, in proximity in between sort of those who are threatened and those who are doing the threatening and sort of absorbing the energy around that. Um, and it does require specific and direct training around that and thought. It, it's not just some willy-nilly thing. Um, it's not an easy answer. 
you know, but I do think that we have a lot of powerful thinkers and folks that have gone before us who have a lot of really helpful information to share with us on how we can engage that. Since you told us the story about your mother, the first <laughs> initial, and obviously now you've become quite an expert on human sexuality. How much of that did you learn in Dr. Archibald's political science? <laughs> 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 Dr. Archibong taught me everything I needed to know. <laughs> we have time for one more question. One more question. I, I wanted to follow up Dr. Ubar's previous question and ask you a little bit about your past with the with history and um, sort of because I felt a little bit akin to you and your experience here at Greensboro College as someone who's attracted to a number of the same and being steeped in just like Christian, Southern, United Methodist culture, and, and being a religion major mm -hmm. myself. Yep. Um, how you wrestled with that tension between exclusion and Christianity, and mm -hmm. you know where you went to for a source of reconciliation? I had a lot of important people that loved on me along the way, um, and I somehow managed to find myself in proximity of other gay folks. Um, that were living their best life. And I sort of lived it through them by proxy at first. Um, and then I went to seminary, interestingly. You talk about where did I go for solace or where did I go to sort of get to the source. I went to seminary. Uh, a lot of gay folks go to seminary, come to find out. I didn't realize that until I got there, but I was surrounded by gay folks at, at Emory especially. Um, and, you know, just really um, seeking out conversations, um, you know, going back to the text and studying for yourself, not taking somebody else's word for it, but going there yourself and really doing research yourself to come to your own answer, using the quadrilateral or some other way of thinking through some of these things. Um, so that's part of it, but I think just relationships, um, and not necessarily even romantic relationships, but, but building friendships and relationships with a wide variety of people. I was, when I was in seminary, um, I got a certificate in black church studies, um, and I actually worked in the women theology and ministry and black church studies office, and so I was around a lot of folks um, who were really, uh, it was interesting to watch a lot of black folks had, who had grown up in a very conservative, sort of uptight Christian experience, and they got into the black church studies program, which really sort of forced folks to kind of take a deeper dive into sort of how Christianity evolved in the uh, black community in the United States. Um, and also some of the, the traditional African um, uh, traditions that are incorporated into the black church experience. And you would all, it was almost like seeing folks come out of the closet as sort of Afrocentric. You know, it was really powerful to watch. And by seeing that happen with other folks, though I'm obviously not a black person, it helped me find my own voice. You know, like watch, you know, seeing other people find their voice or speak their truth, it gives permission to others to do the same. And I'm really indebted to a lot of folks in the black community specifically for being able to find my voice. Um, and so I would just, that, that's kind of how I did it. I know everybody kind of does it a little differently, but I think diversity is life-giving and very, very important, so. Would you please join me in thanking the Reverend Dr. Thank you. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Novlet, we have a tradition here of offering a student a $50 Amazon gift prize for attending. So would you please pull a number? Number four. Number four is Abby Buer. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs> Apologies for having to run. Oh, so. no, yeah, I'm glad. Thank you for being here. It's about the future of our athletic conference. Ah, very important. Reverend Dr.